the Dram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Right, okay, so yes, I have been practicing my good day for several hours and uh, no, I'm not going to be doing it again. Uh, I don't think that uh, doing uh, accents is actually my forte, so uh, I think I'll uh, quit while I'm ahead. Well, you may well think I wasn't ahead with, with that, but anyway, um, I believe that... Um, the tasting whiskey is probably more my forte, and I think that's obviously what you've uh, uh, tuned in to, to watch me do, rather than um, try and murder an Australian accent. Um, maybe I'll murder an Australian whiskey, I don't know. Um, so, yes, uh, as I said last, last week, we're looking at uh, another selection of uh, samples from um, the 2015 World Whiskey Awards, and this will be the first of two parts, uh, or two episodes of the show, I should say, on uh, some... Uh, Australian whiskey, which I think is going to be really interesting. I mean, it's it's been what three odd years. Um, I think the I think I initially tasted these samples back in sort of um, November December of sort of 2014. So it's been three years since I've tasted. So I'm kind of looking forward to um, trying them again. Uh, partly sort of knowing what they are now. Um, not that that should sort of obviously sway one's judgment, of course. Um, but obviously when you're tasting whiskies blind it's it's always a bit tricky because you're kind of trying to pick up on markers and sometimes your brain plays tricks on you and you think well, that's possibly matured in one particular cask when it turns out it's matured in something completely different and you're going, how did I miss that? Um, but anyway, so uh, that's enough of that. We're, we're, like I said, we're, we're looking at uh, the, the, the produce of, uh, of, of three distilleries, two of which are uh, from Tasmania, which is the, um, as you uh, guys that uh, are watching from uh, Australia will know, is the island to the south of, uh, of the, uh, the, the main continent. And um, for you that don't know and are watching from elsewhere, it's the island to the south of the continent. Um, so we're looking at two distilleries from um, Tasmania and we're looking at a third distillery from uh, Western Australia, I believe, if I check my notes, yes, Western Australia. So we're... Looking at, uh, like I said, two distilleries from uh, Tasmania, the, the, probably the most well-known and the main distillery there, although some people may argue with that, but as for, for us that uh, knows very little about uh, distilling in Australia is um, the Lark Distillery, which was founded by a chap called Bill Lark in 1992. And um, he seems to be sort of uh, the, 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 the granddaddy of, uh, of Australian distilling, whether he likes that title or not, of course, is another matter. Uh, but it does seem to me that when there's a new distillery project uh, being planned in the pipeline, constructed, whatever, he's the kind of go-to guy, shall we say. And uh, he's been, like I say, he's been doing it since uh, 1992 when he set up the, the Lark Distillery, which was apparently the first commercial distillery on uh, Tasmania since um, 1839, in actual fact. So um, it certainly seems to be... Uh, uh, if nothing other, a pioneer, shall we say. Uh, one of the interesting things, uh, and, and this is a, a, I suppose, a minor criticism, I guess, uh, that there's really, really very little information about these Australian distilleries online. I mean, even their own websites are really quite sparse when it comes to um, the history of their distilleries. You, maybe it's sort of, you know, a paragraph of... Um, I won't quite say advertising waffle, but I think you kind of get the feel, the understanding of what I'm trying to say. But anyway, from what I found out, this uh, um, Bill apparently uh, uses a local Tasmanian barley um, called, uh, I don't know what it's actually called, to be bloody honest with you, but it's uh, it's uh, malted at the Cascade Brewery and apparently is, uh, is more suited or is generally used in the brewing industry. Um, and... Um, uh, Bill apparently uh, uses it because, and I quote, it creates a lovely, rich, fatty, oily malt that lingers on the palate and gives a big finish. So we'll see if that is indeed true. Apparently he uses a selection of different casts, including American bourbon, or ex-American bourbon, uh, ex-Australian port uh, and sherry, as well as apple brandy. And as you, those of you that know, uh, Australia has uh, quite a... Um, well entrenched uh, wine history and they make fortified wine including a, a, a style of port and a, a style of sherry which obviously means that those casks are shall we say fairly readily available. The same distillery we'll be looking at in Tasmania is called Hellier's Road and um, it's a 
apparently uh, wholly owned by um, the Tasmania's second largest milk processing company, would you believe, called Better Milk. A mm, bit of an odd thing to, uh, to sort of branch out into, but then again, mm, milk and alcohol, mm, okay. Um, so apparently the Hellier's Road uh, was um, founded by a, apparently a group of dairy farmers, so probably I'm guessing that's probably where the, the whole sort of dairy angle kind of comes in, in 1999. And um, it's named after a chap called uh, Henry Hellier, who uh, I believe was a um, uh, cartographer and explorer of some renown in uh, in Australia and um, I'm guessing probably made a road in Tasmania and um, whether this I don't know whether the distillery is close to that road or not but it certainly takes the name of said road and um, the uh, the head distiller there is, is a chap called uh, Mark Littler, uh, who, which I know practically nothing about apart from his name. And um, the distillery produces both peated and unpeated spirit and uses a number of ex uh, port and ex Pinot Noir casks, um, of which neither I've got here today. So <laughs> the ones we'll be looking at will be completely different to those. But, you know, it's. That's distilleries for you, isn't it? And the last distillery we're going to be looking at is um, called, uh, I think, the Great Southern Distillery, or certainly the owners of the distillery are called the Great Southern Distilling Company. So, and again, I'm sort of, not only do I, I kind of struggle with finding information out online, I also struggled with the information that I ended up getting from the World Whiskey Awards because um, it's kind of patchy and it's, you don't know whether the, whether they've actually got the, the titles of the, the, the whiskies uh, or the, the names exactly correct and I'm certainly sort of um, digging around trying to find uh, bottle shots, uh, certainly of the, the two Lark bottlings um, and I've kind of had to sort of take a bit of a guess on those two particular bottles, whether the, the, the samples I have here in front of me were actually in those bottles or whether they're a different bottle shape, I have absolutely no idea. So uh, uh, if I have got the bottle shapes wrong, then you'll just have to forgive me on that one. But anyway, um, back to um, the Great Southern Distillery in Western Australia. Uh, and now I do know a little bit more about this. I think there's a little bit more information on, the, on their website. It was uh, uh, created by a chap called Cameron Syme, who was, um, I believe, working for um, a rather well-known law firm in Melbourne and Perth. And like a lot of these people, I imagine, probably got sick of making <laughs> vast amounts of money and decided they wanted to do so something a bit more um, rewarding, I guess, or rewarding for the soul, maybe, rather than the bank balance. And um, so he did his usual, or my, that, what a lot of of these kind of people do, they take a trip to Scotland, they do some research and they decide that or find that you know their uh, love of whiskey has kind of brought them to this point and you know they want to take it one step further and make it. Me personally I have no desire to set up a distillery, I mean you know <laughs> there's no way I could get my hands on a few million quid to set up a distillery, I much prefer um, tasting and reviewing to uh, actually making the stuff, um, although you know doing it for a week was quite fun. I can't imagine doing it every day for the rest of my life, it has to be said. So, but anyway, um, so not only did uh, did Cameron sort of uh, take time out to sort of visit distilleries in Scotland and talk to uh, people in the industry there, he went and visited the granddaddy, otherwise known as Bill Lark, who apparently uh, gave him plenty of time and uh, information and um, support, I believe. So uh, the Great Sun Distillery was uh, founded in uh, 2004 with production beginning the following year and um, the first release was three years later in 2008 when he uh, started releasing the Lime Burners malt which um, is now obviously well and truly over 10 years old and that's the, the thing about uh, these uh, Australian distilleries a lot of them you think of a lot of them are still young and in relative terms I suppose they are quite young uh, you know, they don't have the sort of you know history of, uh, of some of the Scottish distilleries but you know they've been distilling now for you know a good sort of like you know five ten fifteen odd years and um, you know that they should have some some good stocks of maturing spirit and um, you know hopefully uh, some of these uh, these will be interesting uh, and um, so um, 
I guess the, the, the next logical step is to uh, have a look at what we're going to be tasting today. Right, okay, so um, now this kind of posed its own little challenge, it has to be said, different cask types, varying ABVs and um, ages. Um, so in the end I just basically thought, well let's just do the three separate distilleries separately. It's uh, it kind of makes sense. So we're going to kick off with Hellier's Road. We're going to kick off with this, which is um, a 12-year-old French oak cask. Uh, it was bottled at 46.2, um, and I have absolutely no idea when it was distilled or when it was bottled. I'm guessing it probably bottled somewhere around about 2014, as it was uh, uh, entered for the uh, for the 2015 World Whiskey Awards. But um, that's what we're going to kick off with. The second bottling we'll be looking at was the first of uh, their limited uh, edition he Henry's Legacy series they called it. This was the first bottling called the Gorge uh, which was um, named after a um, uh, something apparently related to uh, Henry Hellier and uh, his mapping out of Tasmania and building roads and all that kind of uh, stuff should we say so this was the first release called uh, the gorge it was bottled at uh, 59.4 and i think that was released in in 2014 um and i think they've gone on to um, do two subsequent releases uh since then uh and as one would imagine probably not particularly cheap um then we're going to move on to the Lark Distillery, the two bottlings from the Lark Distillery we're going to look at. Uh, the first one is now, um, this is a port matured single cask bottled at cask strength of 58%. Um, and that's all I know about it. don't know what, how old it is, don't know when it was distilled, when it was bottled. Um, so hopefully when we taste it that might kind of give us some kind of clues to, uh, to the actual age. And now... The second bottling of theirs, I, I, I must admit, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure of, and not with regards to the quality. This is um, a limited release, single cask, sherry aged, cask strength bottling, bottled at 61%. And I could find absolutely nothing at all about this particular bottling. It does seem that the Lark Distillery like to bottle their cask strength bottlings at 58%, although I did think there was... Uh, one or two that I saw that when I was doing my research that were over 60% but I couldn't find anything out about this particular one um, so whether the ABV is right or not whether the bottle shape is right I have absolutely no idea um, but all I know is I've got some liquid in the glass and we'll, we'll judge the, the, the whiskey on said liquid and finally we're going to look at the lime burners um, only because one of them is peated and they're both quite young. Um, so the first one we're looking at is uh, the Lime Burners uh, Single Cask. This was bottled at 61%, um, although it says 60.5 on there apparently. Uh, again, some of the information that were on the labelling for the World Whiskey Awards sometimes is a little bit incorrect. Now, this is uh, a single cask bottling, like I said, M97, which was an American oak sherry cask and uh, I believe when it was actually bottled it was just purely it was three years old so guessing probably distilled sometime in 2011 and bottled at 2014 possibly I don't honestly know again I'm just kind of grasping at straws and the last one that we'll be looking at is the um, peated uh, single cask which was bottled at 48 percent this was cask uh, a bourbon cask m59 which i'm led to believe at the time when it was released was two years old although i find that slightly difficult to believe i mean again i think if there's anyone out there that actually knows these two whiskies uh, damn sight better than what i do uh, maybe you'll correct me if i was incorrect on that it um <coughs> excuse me so all the information I could seem to sort of find out about this uh, cask M59 was that it was possibly bottled, uh, distilled in 2009, which would mean it would have been bottled in 2011. I mean, just because they've been spirits have been entered into the World Whiskey Awards for that particular year, it doesn't necessarily mean they've had to have been distilled in that year. They could have been distilled way before that. And, you know, there's always different reasons for entering competitions. Um, aside from winning, it's obviously to sort of get your name out there. And, you know, if you're going to use a bottling that you've already done, that's, that's all well and good. So 
Um, so yeah, that's t today's uh, uh, lineup. Um, I hope this is going to be a really interesting tasting. So we'll um, kick off with uh, a bit of um, Hellier's Road then. Okay, so we're going to start off with a fairly modest alcohol level of 46.2. Um, so this is the 12 year old French oak. Let's, let's see what nose goes. For a 12 year old, it's surprisingly young. It has that, it's not off the stilly, but a sort of a slight sort of mari kind of, almost slightly fainty kind of um, character. There's some barley, there's some straw. It's quite oily, it's pungent, there's, there's a lot of impurities in, in the spirit. I mean, again, I don't know what, um, what sort of type of still they're using, but I'm guessing that, that, that this has got, uh, if I was, if was going to guess, it was going to be a fairly small necked still, because this has got quite a, a heavy, oily character, which would seem to indicate a sort of a small neck and um, plenty of, uh, a, a not huge amount of rectification, uh, certainly not from the still. Um, there's a bit of cereal, a bit of maltiness, there's a sort of feeling, shall we say, of maybe some orange fruit, um, and a subtle herbal note there just lurking in the back, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, I'm not getting a lot of maturity, I would expect more maturity for a 12 year old, I'd also expect a little bit more kind of Thai oak as well, um, and there's a little bit of milky vanilla, but there's not the sort of sort of French oak tannins that I would um, normally expect to find with uh, a whiskey that's been matured in French oak. But you know, it's just, it's it's not a bad nose at all. Let's uh, see what the palate gives us. And that's quite nice in the mouth actually. Again, it feels pretty young. It's quite estery. There's some barley, a touch of malt, a lot of citrus. The, the, the alcohol is kind of emphasizing that kind of citrus. It's got a, a dry finish, but the, the creaminess of the oak is kind of coming back on the finish. Um, and if I didn't know, I would personally have thought that was more uh, an American oak cask rather than the French oak cask, because again, I'm not getting that tight. Um, grainy gritty sort of French oak tannin. So a little bit of, of tannin just on the edge um, but it tastes a lot more American a lot more oaky uh, in the vanilla sense anyway and um, it's got a, a really nice aftertaste I'm getting a little bit of um, almost toffee but not quite toffee just almost toffee um, and yeah I mean Again, it, I'm quite surprised. I, I, I'd be under the impression that sort of um, whiskies in Australia or spirit in Australia, a bit like spirit in um, uh, places like India, where it's a lot hotter, are going to mature a lot quicker. Uh, I mean, there's possibly this has been uh, aged in, in a temperature-controlled warehouse, possibly uh, to, to kind of get that kind of longevity. I don't honestly know. Again. One's just kind of making up, uh, making guesses, uh, not necessarily making up as one goes along, but just making kind of guesses. But I think, um, I think to start off with, I think that's uh, that's pretty good. Right, okay, so let's move on to the gorge. Uh, so bottled at 59.4, and um, guessing this is probably a selection of, uh, of casks of, of varying ages and. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm expecting some top quality juice in this, so let's uh, see what the nose gives us. Oily, quite fat, it's got um, some barley notes, it's got a, a slight soapiness possibly. Um, it, it feels quite young, I wouldn't quite say raw, but it's, it's kind of youthful, it's got a a grittiness is almost a kind of like a rye light sort of spiciness um, in the background. Definitely getting cereal notes, a lot of cereal. Um, and it's, it's kind of reminding me of a, of a, of a sort of a, a young American whiskey in actual fact. Um, 
It's certainly got that kind of feel to it. I mean, obviously those notes may well be coming from the cask, because judging from the colour, I'm guessing this has been aged in American oak. Um, there's a, a little bit of a whininess there, sort of in the background. Um, so it's possible that this might have been finished in a wine cask, um, or it might just be that the way this particular uh, batch of casks has kind of gone. Again, I don't know whether this is a single cask or not, or uh, whether it was a, um, a batch, but um, yeah, it's um, it's young, it's oily. There's a, there, there feels like there's some estuary fruit there, uh, and I'm wondering whether it's possibly that giving it a little drop of water will uh, kind of bring that fruit note out, but um, let's, let's see what the power gives us. That's a big mouthful. Whiny, juicy, cereally. There's a little bit of granulated sugar sprinkling on that cereal. Um, there's a lot of wood now, a lot of wood on the, on the middle. Um, licorice, a uh, touch of herbs, loads and loads of malt. I mean, that's really, really deep. That's an impressive spirit, it has to be said. Um, it's a bit short, obviously. That's, that's kind of... Uh, um, what the alcohol is doing is very mouth-watering, but oh, that packs some punch, I can tell you. Um, that is really, really intense. Um, but I can tell the, the spirit is, is exceptionally good. Um, yeah, a little bit of oak coming through right on the right on the very finish, getting a little bit of toffee. Um, but uh, let's see what water has uh, done, see whether it's opened the nose up or not. Not really, it's actually made a little bit more whiny and soapy, to be honest with you. Uh, to be honest with you, it's not really done it a huge amount of favours putting uh, putting the water with it. And um, there's a, well, there's a, again, there is some citrus kind of lurking there, but it's it's kind of battling against all the sort of like the, the, the impurities, the sort of um, the soapiness and the, um, yeah, it's... I think I think the palette was really impressive, um, but I'm I'm just not quite so so enamoured by the uh, the nose at all. But let's see what uh, what's happened to the palette now, then, shall? That's really brought out the sugars. That is a lovely palette. And I, I, I'm struggling to understand the sort of the dichotomy between the nose and the palate. I mean, yes, you do get that. I've tasted numerous whiskies that will have, you know, uh, almost diametrically opposed nose and palate. And, but this is just lovely, juicy. There's some lovely soft oak. Um, it's mouth filling. It's classy. Um, loads of barley character. And yet the nose is... Um, to me quite disappointing and um, yeah I think uh, I think that kind of sums it up sort of uh, really great palette just not a big fan of the nose okay so let's move on to the first of the two bottlings from the Lark Distillery this is the port matured single cask uh, bottled at 58% let's see what the nose gives us then shall we Really clean. Um, there's a slight sort of portiness to it, but I remember sort of like from rereading my notes that it kind of kind of came across more like sherry, and it does have a real sherry character. I mean, there's dried fruits, there's raisins, and juicy plums, and now you, when you know that it's a port cask, you think. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm getting a little bit of portiness there, a little bit of, of whiny sort of black fruit, possibly. It's quite herbal, again, which is not something I would normally associate with um, port, more more um, the sort of like the sherry. There's a touch of smoke, but, uh, which I think is more wood smoke than, uh, it's certainly not peat. Um, 
getting some age coming coming through. It's got a bit of a, a sort of slight Armagnacky kind of rancio, um, a little bit of dried fruit, uh, baked fruit. I mean, that might be more coming from the cask rather than the actual spirit itself, but it's complex, it's interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's good quality spirit. I mean, yeah, there's, there's no off notes, no roughness, it's very soft. So um, let's see what the palette's like. Chunky, juicy, rich, a lot of tannin, really drying up the, 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 the mouth. I mean, obviously part of that is down to the alcohol level as well as the tannin, and it's really, really drying that finish out. But underneath you can feel um, some lovely juicy fruits, um, so dried fruits, um, again, slightly winy character. Um, Lots of spice, certainly on the aftertaste, is tongue tingling spice. I mean, that is, whoa, that is really, really impressive. That's that's intense, as we said. Let's uh, let's put a little drop of water with it and um, see what that does uh, to uh, to this particular whiskey. So uh, um, let's see what the nose is happening now. Sweeter, cleaner. Um, well, cleaner is probably the wrong word. Lighter, possibly. Um, more wininess now, more red and black fruits, more vanilla, um, lovely depth to it, it's very, very impressive, it has to be said. Touch of barley as well kind of coming out, it's not not sort of like a one-dimensional wine cask uh, finished or matured uh, malt, I mean, again, port matured would seem to sort of put the emphasis on the fact that it spent its entire uh, life in a port cask and if that is indeed the case it it feels like it's got some age to it like I said there was um, definitely some sort of oxidized baked fruit kind of character which I would associate with prolonged um, maturation and um, yeah a little bit of a little bit of burnt um, burnt wood coming out now this is yeah, really good let's see what the palace like softer, still a little bit tannic and dry, but there's a little bit more of that sort of juicy fruit, it's more rounded, um, possibly a little simpler, a little bit more emphasis on, on the sort of the winy fruits, um, it's a touch of uh, marzipan kind of coming through right on the finish, um, but yeah, I like that, That's that's got some interest, um, Certainly, you can't argue with the quality of uh, of that particular whiskey. How much that costs, um, I have absolutely no idea. But I imagine by the time these uh, whiskies kind of get over to the UK, if at all they do, I think the only one I've actually seen over here on uh, on a website is um, is Limeburn, as an actual fact. And I can tell you for a start that that ain't cheap. Um, but coming back to to this particular bottling, I think uh, I think that's really impressive. I think. Uh, Really good quality. Okay, so now let's move on to the limited release single sherry cast. Now, I mean, look at that colour of that, William. It's almost black. I mean, I don't know if you can pick that up or not, but, I mean, it is literally black. Um, you know, we're, we are talking serious first fill sherry, and, um, well... I don't think there's going to be an awful lot else other than that, that and alcohol probably, but uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's see where that's good is. Yeah, big, treacly, monstrously juicy sherry. It's probably not quite as dry as, 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 uh, as maybe European sherry cask. I mean, I'm guessing again that this is probably an, um, an Australian sherry uh, cask possibly. Yeah, there's a touch of rye-like herbs, licorice, treacle, touch of spice, touch of 
burnt wood, more herbs, more rye kind of herbs. Um, yeah, that's that's a, a big old sherry monster. Um, absolutely no doubt about that. No distillery character, no barley, no anything else. This is just big, monstrous and sherried. Um, if you like that kind of whiskey, then obviously you're going to wet yourself over this. But <laughs> I'm afraid that uh, I'm kind of a little bit ambivalent, shall we say. Um, but I will give it its dues. It is sort of pristinely clean and you would expect that I mean I imagine like I said if it's a, an Australian uh, uh, ex-sherry cask then hasn't exactly had far to go um, and it certainly has a sort of grapey whiny not PXy almost kind of I don't know if you've ever sort of tasted uh, Rutherglen um, Muscat and it's it's kind of got that kind of whiny grapiness um, as opposed to sort of PX but um, yeah Either way, it's a sherry monster and I haven't got enough to stick any water with it so I'm just going to have to taste it uh, as it is. So, let's see what the palate's like. Oh, that's monstrous. Monstrously treacly. Herbal, intense, huge. It's an intense monster, it has to be said. Um, <laughs> I mean, all right. It's kind of, yeah, it's it's big. There's there's no real elegance, it has to be said. And um, you're never going to get that with sort of, you know, something that, that's relatively young, filled into a first fill sherry cask. Um, there's lots of sherry character. It's appealing to those kind of people that love sherry whiskies. Um, and... You know, what I will say for it is that it's absolutely blemish free uh, and there's no shortage of sherry character whatsoever. For me, like I said, as you well know, it's kind of leaving me a little bit cold. I mean, yeah, okay, every now and again I'd like the odd sherry dram, um, but, you know, I'm guessing this was not cheap, shall we say, and uh, I'd find it difficult to sort of stick my hand in uh, in my pocket, certainly to sort of pull out three figures for something that's just been... Um, completely obliterated by sherry and um, it's got a lovely raisinated kind of finish and it's yada 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 but you know at the end of the day the nose had some interest the nose was kind of leading me in a sort of a, a slightly different direction but the palate is just kind of like sherry it, it, it could come from anywhere and um, that's that's just just my opinion Okay, so let's move on to the first of the uh, the two lime burners. Uh, so this is, uh, like I said, Bourbon Cask M15, no, M97. Uh, again, this is an American oak sherry, so I'm expecting a little bit more vanilla character, a little bit less of that sort of overtly oloroso -y sort of character. And judging from the colour as well, it's a lot lighter. I mean, it's certainly nowhere near as black as the, um, the Lark bottling. So anyway, let's see what the nose gives us young um, but not too young like I say I th from memory I I believe the blurb said it was uh, three years old and I can kind of believe that although it's it's got some nice roundness for, for a three-year-old uh, whiskey it's got a bit of taut um, herbal sherry some barley there's a there's a sort of like a oh, it's 61 percent so <laughs> there's some alcohol there funnily enough um, it's got some nice sweetness. Um, again, the herbal character seems to be the sort of like the, the dominating aspect of this, but it's not such a, a monster as the as the lark, shall we say? In actual fact, I'm really quite enjoying that herbal note. Um, it has that sort of kind of serially herbally rye kind of character, which um, I suppose I kind of like. I kind of enjoy and. Uh, being sort of fairly young, it's got that, yeah, I kind of like that in, in sort of young uh, American whiskies as well, uh, whereas I'm guessing other people don't, but then, you know, I don't particularly like sherry monsters, other people do, yeah, it's it's kind of, you know, horses for courses, isn't it? Um, it's not majorly complex, shall we say, um, I mean, it's, yeah, there's some, some nice elements there, um, but the, the, the reality is that this could have done with a damn sight longer in the cask. 
Um, maybe the cask would have gotten stronger, but I don't know. Just I just think it could have done with a bit more time. But anyway, let's uh, see what the pallet's back. Sweeter, softer, more sherry, more treacle, um, a little, that not quite so much of that herbal kind of rye kind of character, it's a little bit of cereal, it's a bit short but then that's obviously the alcohol at play, um, touch of spice, mm, you know, pleasant, you know, it's it's kind of, like I said, it's, it's un, unfettered by complexity I think um, is <laughs> one way of putting it, but um, it's pleasant, I mean it's certainly got no rough edges, it's very soft, it's smooth. Um, whether I would want to pay again three figures for it, of course, is, uh, is another matter. And that does seem to be one of the issues with a lot of these uh, distilleries uh, from other parts of the world, uh, limited releases and that, by the time they're over in this country, they're, you know, they're asking for an arm and a leg. And some of it, some, not necessarily the limited releases, the sort of core releases sometimes, you sort of taste them and you think, you want me to retail that for how much? But anyway, let's, let's see if water has done anything for the nose. It's a little bit more orange, possibly. Um, touch more oiliness. But pretty much, it has, it's not really done an awful lot to it, to be, it, to be fair. Um, apart from obviously sort of, you know, taking down the alcohol a notch or two rather than sort of bringing out anything um, new aroma wise. Let's, let's see what, uh, what's happened to the palate. It's a bit softer. It's a bit more sugars coming out now. Um, simpler, a little bit more one-dimensional. There's yeah, there's a little bit of herbalness there. It's kind of it's okay. I think is 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 the way I would put it. It doesn't have a huge amount of complexity for a three-year-old spirit. It's actually really very very drinkable and very enjoyable. And I imagine that if you could get it in your local market should we say for a reasonable price you'd probably be quite happy with that but for three figures over here in the UK I'd want an awful lot more complexity for, for, for that um, it's a curio um, and you know I'm I personally wouldn't feel comfortable with selling what in essence is a, is, is a curio for, for, for that kind of money so um, but Coming back to, to the actual spirit itself, I think it's actually quite impressive uh, for, for a three-year-old spirit. I think it certainly shows that given a little bit more time, a little bit more ageing in the cask, it's got, it's got potential. You know, it could it'd be interesting to see how that developed. So, but um, yeah, three figures. Mm. Okay, so now let's move on to the, uh, the peated um, single cask. Uh, line burners, let's see what those gives us on this end, shall we? Ooh, that's lovely. Um, that is absolutely delightful. It's estuary, it's young. Um, I mean, if this is two years old, uh, I'm, I'm kind of blown away, it has to be said. It's got that sort of slightly pineapple y, apple y, barley. There's some lovely um, soft American oak. There's a, a bit of Almost, almost kind of rye-like herbs. There's a touch of um, just a subtle um, earthy sort of peat note to it. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, I think this is this to me. This kind of ticks all the boxes for for a whiskey. I love the sort of exuberantly estery kind of fruity whiskies, um, and this certainly has it in uh, in absolute buckets. This is again, it's not not majorly complex. Um, but it really delivers, and um, yeah, the, the, I mean, if the quality is this good at two years old, then 
Yeah, um, the, I mean the distillery's what been around since you know, 2000, 2005, so I, I'd love to taste a sort of like you know, a 10 year old uh, bottling of theirs, whether they do them or not, of course I honestly couldn't say, but uh, um, this is absolutely lovely, I mean, and, and sometimes I keep coming back to this kind of point, you know, you don't need fancy wine casks, you don't need sherry casks, all you need is good quality American oak, um, and just let your spirit do the talking, you know. Um, why kind of swamp uh, all, the, all the character that you're getting from your distillery in um, uh, a wine cask or uh, whatever. So, mmm, that is absolutely gorgeous. That's, um, let's see what the power's like. Full barley, juicy, slightly herbally, estery, fruity, touch of toffee oak, um, very subtle peat, um, again more sort of dry and earthy, sort of almost kind of crumbly. Mm, that is lovely. It's got a lovely weight to it, good length. Again, not hugely complex, but you know, I think it does what it does really, really well. Um, and that just kind of like, yeah, that ticks kind of all my boxes, it has to be said. Um, again, whether it's worth a hundred and something odd pounds, of course, is, is obviously open to debate. But uh, um, on the face of it, that is an absolutely superb whiskey, really good. Okay, so let's sum today's uh, episode of the show up. I think it's been really interesting in actual fact. And... Um, I think there's kind of two ways you can kind of look at um, these whiskies. I think um, you can look at it from a purely sort of quality of the spirit point of view and then you can look at it as a point of view uh, for value for money and of course obviously the whole value for money business is kind of based more on external factors rather than it is on anything to do with the distillery. Um, I mean for example, your average Scottish distillery, they'll probably have a, a rep out on the road, um, they'll come and visit up me, the, 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 uh, the retailer, um, they'll say you, your minimum order is X, here's your price, everybody pays exactly the same, we all know where we stand, the only difference being um, between sort of one retailer and the other is, is at the end of the day the margin that they uh, put on them. Um, but when you look at a, a whiskey from the rest of the world, that kind of thing, it starts to get a little bit sort of more murky. Um, you know, you, for example, you know, let's take lime burners for example. They probably sell sell their whiskey to um, a, a wholesaler in in Australia, who then in turn sell, probably sells it to a wholesaler in Europe, who then probably in turn sells it to a wholesaler in the UK who then in turn sells it to the retailer and you've, you've got sort of all these different steps and each step is adding between 15 and 30 uh, percent to the cost of what is already a relatively expensive whiskey because they're single cask bottlings, they're cask strength, you then add on the duty factor and all this kind of stuff and, and suddenly you, you're, you're looking at you know a whiskey that is you know a hundred and something odd pounds and you're thinking I don't really think this is worth it. The, the, the spirit is good, but it's not worth what I've got to actually retail it for. And this is a conundrum that I'm often faced with. Not just world whiskies, but all sorts of whiskies in actual fact. And, you know, it's not just a case of judging them for the quality of the spirit. You're judging them for the quality of what you've got to then eventually retail them to the customer for. And if I don't think the quality is there to meet that particular price that I've got to sell it for, then... I'm just not going to bother stocking it. What's the point? You know, I'd rather stock something that, that I think that has got the quality. But kind of coming back to um, the individual distilleries, the uh, the Hellier's Road, I think obviously they're making good spirit. You can't knock that. The, the gorge, the RK, the nose possibly let that bottling down. The palate, I thought, was, was very good. As the 12-year-old um, uh, 
French oak, although, like I said, I didn't really get a huge amount of you know, French oak character. Um, just, just one of those things, I guess. Although, uh, still, you, know, you can't sort of knock the quality of the, the spirit. The same goes for the lark. I mean, I think the port matured was, was really good. Really enjoyed that. Not too porty, nice balance. The sherry, on the other hand, well, it was a sherry monster, you know, and uh, to me that leaves me a little bit cold as I've said but again I don't think you could question that the, certainly not the quality of the sherry cask that it was matured in that was certainly as clean as a whistle um, and lime burners I mean the single malt um, again probably slightly more balanced on the sherry a little bit young not so much progression um, not my favorite of the two but certainly the peated it, it just ticked all the boxes as far as I'm concerned. Um, lovely estuary uh, character. In my opinion, if I'm producing spirit like that, I'm not going to bother shoving it in a sherry cask. It's, it's all complete, defeats the object as far as I'm concerned because there goes your distillery character, uh, all that lovely estuary fruitiness and uh, all that kind of stuff. And um, but then that's me, that's that's just my humble opinion and um, I think if you obviously live in Australia and you can get hold of these bottlings at you know a reasonable price then certainly I think um, they are definitely worth it but obviously by the time they get over into the UK when the price has been um, considerably uh, increased uh, the, the value for money doesn't look quite so good. But then again, if you've got deep pockets and you fancy trying these things out, then well, well, go for it. You know, it's like uh, I, I, I'm in obviously in a, a very rarefied position that I get the the the, the ability to taste these uh, whiskies um, without actually having to pay for them. So, oh, lucky me! Um, <laughs> somebody's got to do this job, as they say. So, anyway. That's this week's episode of the show in the bag. I, I really hope you enjoyed it. It's been a bit of a long one, but then that's because too many of these needed a little drop of water. And uh, um, let's, uh, so, you know, hopefully, you, like I say, you've enjoyed it. We'll be uh, tasting some more uh, Australian whiskey, uh, hopefully this time next week. So until then, um, all that's left to say is uh, good afternoon and good running.